doing chapter 11. Okay. This is on different concentrations. And the first part is how we describe different certain types of concentrations. Um, a, uh, a solution is just a mixture of two things. There's two parts to a solution. There is a solute and a solvent. The solvent is the bigger part, what we dissolve it into. The solute is what we add to it. Like if you're gonna make salt water rinses to rinse with it, something like that, or to wash something out, the solvent is the water. The solute is the salt you pour into it. So that's the terminology for our solutions. The solutions have different concentrations. You know, if you pour one teaspoon of salt in there or 10 teaspoons, it changes the concentration of your solution. Okay, so solution is made up of solute and a solvent. There's different ways of looking at these concentrations. We can go uh, concentration, where are we at here? Let's go follow the book. We can do a percent by mass or percent by volume. For a percent by mass, so the mass percent, okay, is the mass of your solute, how many grams or whatever you put in your solution, divided by the mass of your solution, okay, times 100 to give you a percentage, okay? The volume percentage, okay, is the volume of your solute divided by the volume of your solution times 100, okay? So if we have a, Let's say we're going to add um, ethanol to water to make vodka, bourbon, whatever, and it makes it all different percentages. Okay. So say we have, a, let's do a volume percentage. Say we have 300 milliliters of ethanol. Okay. And we're going to add that to one liter. <laughs> to one liter of water. What's the volume percent of the vodka you're making? You take the volume of your solute, which is a smaller one. So that's the volume, which is 300 milliliters divided by a liter of water. Your, your, your volume of your solution. Now the volume of solution is a combination of both. It's a whole solution. So you have 300 milliliters of ethanol and you got a thousand milliliters of water because okay? one liter is a thousand milli is a thousand milliliters and you have to make sure everything's in the same units so this is 1300 milliliters so the volume of our solution remember your solution is the solute plus the solvent. Most of the times, you know, if they add it, if it's like a mass, you can just a little bit of, of like salt to water, something like that. So you have 1,300 milliliters times 100. So your percent is going to be 300 divided by 1,300 times 100 for your percentage. So 300, let's get my trusty calculator here. 300 divided by 1300 times 100. That gives you a 23% solution of, your, of the vodka. That's how strong it is. That's a volume percent. It's a percentage of the strength okay, of the solute by volume. Okay. So it's gonna remember it's volume of solution, not volume of, um, of solvent. It's volume of solution. Yeah. The solution is made up of the solute plus the solvent. Okay. You just then they did simple math. You want to do a, ma a mass one? Let's do another one of mass. Let's say a mass percentage. Let's say we're adding 32 grams of salt, sodium chloride, to one liter of water. Okay. Now you want to know the mass percentage. Mass percentage is mass of your solute, which in this case is 32 grams, 
divided by mass of the solution. So mass of the solution is you have one liter water. And remember for water, one gram, there's one gram per one milliliter. So every milliliter of water weighs one gram. Okay, at, at a regular uh, pressure and standard temperature. Right. So we have a one liter of it, we have a thousand grams, right? So you have a thousand gram, a thousand, one liter is a thousand milliliters. A thousand milliliters is a thousand grams. Okay. So we have a thousand grams plus our 32 grams of salt that we added times 100. Okay. Everybody see why we're adding? Most students forget this part right here. Because the solution consists of your solute plus your solvent. Your solute is what you add to it. So it's 32 grams divided by our total solution. The weight of the water is 1,000 grams. That's one liter. And the weight of the salt we added is 32 grams. And then we times 100 to give us a percentage. So we take 32 divided by 1,032. Okay. And then we times 100. And that gives us 3.1%. So mass solution. So that's your mass percentage and that's your volume percentage. Okay. Make sense so far? So let's do uh, let's do one of the ones we have from the your book here, just so we can do one for there. Uh, one of the ones right from your book says a chemist prepares a solution by adding one kilogram of salt, 1.0 kilograms of salt, NaCl or any type of salt actually, to five kilograms of water. And they want to know what is the percent by mass of salt in the solution. So our percent by mass is our mass of our solute, which in this case is one kilogram, divided by the mass of our solution, which in this case is 5.0 kilograms of water plus one kilogram of the salt. Remember, solution is both solute and solvent. Don't forget that when you're doing these problems. Times 100. So it's one divided by one six times 100 is probably a little less than 20. So let's do one divided by six times 100. So it was 16.7% by mass. Okay. That making sense? Okay. In certain. Yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Cool. Um, someone can hear me, at least. All right. You can also do one other variation, which is done in nursing. We use it with the IV solutions. It's mass volume percent. Okay. The only place we say that use these with IV solutions. And what that is, is your mass of your solute divided by the volume of your solution, and then times 100. So it's just the same. You just take, instead, instead of the, you take your mass of salt or your ring or solution, whatever you're putting in, whatever electrolytes you're putting in your patient, and divide it by the volume of your solution instead of the, that. So you get an expression of, instead of having a percentage of, of grams, this is grams per volume, grams per milliliter. So the units of this would be grant at the end of the grams per milliliter. So 0.9% grams per milliliter. And that's the only difference there. All right. If the solutions are very, very diluted, you know, the whole very, very tiny amounts, like uh, contaminants in a, a stream or water supply. We do what's called parts per million or parts per billion. Okay. 
So if you're dealing with, um, let's say there's arsenic contamination in your drinking water and you're allowed to have a certain percentage before it becomes harmful, which we have. Say we measured out and it's 45 times 10 to the negative seven grams is how many grams of arsenic we have okay. per, let's say, liter of water. Okay. So how do we express that as a mass percentage? So it's 45 times 10 to the minus seven grams divided by the solution, which is one liter of water. Liter of water is a thousand grams. So one kilogram or 1,000 grams, so the grams can cancel in this case, okay? Now we normally add in the solute, but the solute is times 10 to negative seven. It's not gonna make any effect on the mass of the solution, okay? That's 10 to the minus seven grams. So it's not gonna affect the weight of the solution at all, okay? So our expression is gonna be 45 times 10 to the, and this, this is 10 to the third. So 10 to the minus three makes that. 10 to the minus 10 grams. Now we want to express that in parts per million. A million is 10 to the six. So we just times 10 to the six. And that gives us 45 times 10 to the, in this case it would be negative four. And that's parts per million. If you want parts per billion, you take that same number times 10 to the ninth. So the billion is 10 to the ninth, a million is 10 to the sixth. So this becomes 45 times 10 to the, and this becomes uh, negative 4.5. So this expresses as 4.5. This one was one, two, this is 0 0.0045. Okay. It's just a way of expressing it. So it's just parts per billion. You times a billion to it, how many parts you have per billion particles. So it's 4.5 parts per billion or 0 0.0045 parts per million. This is an easy way to handle very, very small numbers. That's why we do it. You'll see if you read fluoride reports for like the 29 pounds water supply, it'll be in parts per million. Okay, Arsenic levels will be parts per million. It's just a way of expressing it. You're not putting all these zeros in front of the number. Okay, that's all it is. Just multiplying by that, and you're saying it's parts per million. It's just bringing that number to a more manageable number, which makes more sense to people. Okay? And that's all it is. It doesn't change about the number at all. It's just your parts per million to parts per billion. Okay, very, very small. You can do parts per trillion if you wanted to, but most commonly it's parts per million or parts per billion. And it's usually talking about contaminants in a, a food product or contaminants in a, a water supply because you're allowed a certain amount. And the amount is your allowed is very small. So you express it in parts per million to parts per billion. Okay, concentrations in there. That looks good. All right. Now, most of the things we're dealing with this in the rest of these solutions is what we call molarity. Molarity is a big M. Okay. Well, that's that's molarity. Molarity is moles of your solute. Remember, your solute is what you added to your solution or your solvent. Moles of solute per liter of solution. Okay, that's the definition of molarity. So we have a five molar solution. We have five moles of whatever we have, sodium chloride, sodium hydroxide, potassium chloride, Five moles of that per liter of solution, thousand milliliters. Those are concentration. That's the definition. So we'll be able to use that number as a conversion number, because now we can convert moles in a liquid to moles in a chemical equation if we know the, the amount of solution we have. So we can put it back in the stoic county, which we'll do for you, just to show that we can do that. So molarity is moles per liter. That's what you need to remember. Okay. 
And let's do one of your examples in the book here so you can clarify that for you. All right, let's do example 11.4. It says an aqueous solution has a volume of 9.41 liters. So you have the solution and it contains, you have the volume of the solution is 9.41 liters. Okay. It contains 412.3 grams, 412.3 grams of dissolved potassium chloride. Okay. And it wants to know, find the molarity of the solution. Okay. So potass potassium chloride is our solute. Why is it the solute? Because it's the smallest. It's going to be diluted into the solution. It's what was that? Going to be diluted into the solution. Perfect. It's diluted. It's, it's perfectly right. You're diluted into the solution. It's the smaller amount going into the larger amount. That's the amount of salt going into this big uh, nine point nine you know, nine point four liters of solution, right? So we have to convert that into mole because the top part of molarity is moles of solute. So we have four point one, two, three grams potassium chloride. And potassium is one potassium, one chlorine. And that comes out, it gives you the problem at 74.55 grams. So 74.55 grams per mole. That's the molecular weight is. So for, uh, 400, 412.3 divided by 74.55 comes out to 5.531 moles. Okay. So now we got moles and we got liters of solution. So molarity is moles of solute, 5.531 moles per how much solution do we have? We have 9.41 liters of solution. That gives us molarity. So 5.531 divided by 9.41 comes out 2.588 Molar. And that's that molar just means moles of solution, is molar molarity. Okay. Pretty straightforward. We will we'll be using that a lot. Okay. Let's do one. We have to rearrange it a little bit. Let's do another one from your textbook. And it says, how many moles of silver nitrate are present in 15 milliliters of a 0.12 molar solution of silver nitrate? So we have a 1.2 molar solution of silver nitrate. All right. And it wants to know how many moles of silver nitrate are there in 15.0 milliliters. Okay. So we know our molarity, we have the molarity of the solution. Molarity is equal to moles of your solute, which is silver nitrate, divided by the liters of your solution. Okay. And we're looking for moles of silver nitrate so we just rearrange this a little bit. Moles is equal to the molarity times your liters of solution. Okay. Molarity you said is 1.2 moles per liter. That's the molarity. And the amount of solution is 15 milliliters. Now, milliliters and liters don't cancel, right? So we got to convert this into liters. Okay, milliliter is, milliliter is 10 to the negative three. Okay, so that is how many moles we have because liters will cancel. Mil um, where are we at? And then milliliters will cancel. There's milliliters and there's liters. And you're left with moles. 
So you come up with, let's put in our solution here, uh, 1.2. You can use this all kinds of ways. So 1.2 times 15 comes out to 18 times 10 to the negative three, which comes out to 0 0.018 moles of silver nitrate. Okay, just rearrange it a little bit. You can calculate either way. You can calculate moles or you can keep volumes of volume. So let's see what else they got on this section you look. We have molarity. And okay, so let's do another from the picture that says how to how to prepare one of these solutions to get this. Let's pick one here. And then we'll go into dilutions. All right, so it says, while working in a forensic lab, you need to prepare 20, two, two liters. So you have to make two liters of solution, and the solution is going to be 1.4 molar of sodium hydroxide. 1.40, actually. 1. 1.40 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. So how do you make that? Okay. First of all, you gotta calculate how many moles of so you're, you've got, right? You wanna know how many moles of sodium hydroxide you need because you have to find how much you have to weigh it. Because in the lab, you have to weigh it out. Okay. So you have to determine moles and for moles, we can determine grams. Okay. So we want a, we're gonna calculate the number of moles. So we go, like we did before, molarity, is moles of solid per liter of solution. So we want to calculate the number of moles. So our moles are equal to molarity times our volume, times our liters. The molarity we said was 1.40 moles per liter, that's molarity. And the amount of volume we have the solution is two liters. We want to make two liters of it for our experiment we need to use. Liters cancel, We're left with moles. 1.4 times two comes out to 2.80 moles. So we need 2.80 moles of sodium hydroxide. That's still to help us in the laboratory. We have to find out our mass, right? So you got 2.80 moles of sodium hydroxide. And I want to convert that into grams. So how many grams per mole of sodium hydroxide? We have one sodium, one oxygen, one hydrogen. That comes out to roughly 40 grams. Okay, let me weigh that out. So now we take 40 times 2.8 is 112. Times two okay, is 112 grams of sodium hydroxide. So if we need a solution in doing a forensic test, that's 1.4 molar, and we need two liters of it, we take two liters of water, we measure it out in a volumetric class, two liters of water, and we add 112 grams of sodium hydroxide to it. That will give us this molarity at two liters of solution. So we can use that in our experiment or whatever we're trying to determine. Because to make a solution, in a lab, you have to figure out how many grams. You can't measure out moles. You can only measure out, you can weigh out grams and add it to the solution. Okay? All that making sense so far? Let's do a thumbs up or a thumbs yeah. down. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. All right, the next step on this is uh, dilutions. Now, dilutions, we have a formula. Of course, you have a formula. The good thing about this is once you see the word dilution in any of my questions on your, on your final coming up, okay, you only have one formula. That's it. 
There's no choices. There's no P1, V1, it goes P2, V2. There's no PV, it's MRT. You don't decide anything. If you see the word dilution, you are going to use M1, V1 equals M2, V2. That's it. That's your only choice. And you can put like M, M initial, and the book has your M initial, V initial, M final, V final. So it's the beginning one and the end one. M1, V1 equals M2, V2. And that's how you do all your dilutions. That's your only formula we have for dilutions. So once you see the word dilution of problem, think M1, V1 equals M2, V2. All right. So let's put it, let's uh, dilute a solution. Let's say you have 25, let's do 11.6 in your book. It says you have a 25 milliliters, uh, milliliters of a 10 molar solution of potassium hydroxide. You had enough water to make 500 milliliters of dilute solution. What is the molarity of your final solution? So you've got, you're starting with 25 milliliters. Okay, of a 10 molar solution, which is a pretty strong concentration solution of potassium hydroxide. Okay, that's what you're starting with. And you're going to take that and you're going to add enough water to make the total 500 milliliters. So you're going to go from 20, you're not, now be really careful here. You're not adding 500 milliliters. You're adding 475 milliliters. You're bringing the total volume solution up to 500. That's what these numbers stand for, total volume. They don't stand for what you're adding. Because on, the, on, your, on your final, I'll do a question like that. We have to determine how much you add, not the total volume. So be careful. Be very careful. You answer the question I'm asking, not the answer you want to just give me. Okay, so we're adding it to a total volume of 500 milliliters. And it wants to know what's the molarity of the final solution. Okay, you have M1V1 equals M2V2. So put your numbers in. M1 is your initial molarity, which is 10. V1 is your initial volume, which is 25. The uh, final molarity is what you need to know, what we're looking for. And the final volume was the volume we brought up to total 500 milliliters. Now, you make sure all the units are the same, milliliters and milliliters, so we're good there, and molarity. So we're looking for M2. So M2, rearrange the equation, is M1, V1, divided by V2. Okay, just rearrange the equation. All right, and then plug in our numbers, which you put in there. So M1 is 10. More. And V1 was 25 milliliters. V2 is 500 milliliters. Milliliters cancel, you left with volume, with, with uh, molarity. So 10 times 25 is 250. 250 by 500 is one half. So it's 0.5. So 0 0.5 zero, zero molarity. That's the molarity of the solution. Now, would the molarity change if instead of potassium hydroxide, we used calcium chloride? Would your answer change at all? No. No, it doesn't matter what you're using. Now, when we get into colligative properties in the last section of this, then we'll get into the different dissociations. But for just uh, dilutions and solutions, you just doesn't matter what you're dissolving. It's all going to be done the same exact way. It's not going to change your values. Unless you're measuring out grams and you have to calculate it into moles. Okay. But molarity dilutions are all the same for any type of solution that you have. So let's do one more. Okay. Let's say we use some of the similar properties here. This is like when you might see on your final. Uh, from the, it says you have 30 milliliters. You're starting with 30 
0 0.0 milliliters, okay, of a 7.80 molar solution of magnesium bromide. Okay, that's what you're starting with. That's your stock solution. You want to dilute that. Okay, once you see the word dilute, what do you think of? Once you see that word dilute, what do you think? M1V1 equals M2V2. Perfect. As soon as you see the word dilute, that's what you think of. You know, because you only got one formula for dilutions, and it's M1V1 equals M2V2. Okay, once you see the word dilute, it says we want to dilute that until the magnesium bromide concentration. Concentration is brackets. When you, when you see brackets around something, it means concentration. You want to dilute that to a concentration of 0.5 or 0 0.5, 0 0.50 molar. So that's what you want to do. Okay. So what volume, how much water? So the question would read, how much water? <coughs> Do you add, okay, to your existing solution, okay, your 30 milliliters of 7.8 molar magnesium bromide to get a 0 0.50 molar solution, okay? So how much are we gonna add to make that 0.5 molar? We've gone from 7.8 down to 0.5, so we're diluting it, right? You start at 7.8, 0 0.5 is a lot less. You're diluting that solution. So how much water do you add to it to make it 0.5? So M1, V1, M2, V2. So M1 is 7.8 molar. V1, your initial volume is 30.0 milliliters. M2. And you're going to dilute it to a 0 0.5, 0 molar solution. And your volume of number two is your question, right? Okay. So we've set it up looking for V2. V2 is equal to M1V1 over M2. Okay. That's the toughest part is setting it up. Everybody can do the math. I know that. But if you set up this little table here on the side, I know it, sometimes it looks kind of silly because you can see the numbers on top. But if you set up that little table, you're not going to make a mistake. You're going to look at your numbers. You go, oh, we just plug the numbers in there. OK, so V2 equals M1 is 7.8 molar. Volume 1 is 30 milliliters. And volume two, we want to, and I'm uh, not, no, well, sorry. M2 is 0 0.50 molar. Can well, we just stick to that equation for the final? Can we do what? Can we just stick to that equation for the final and nothing else? Yep. No, 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 not nothing else. We'll have that on the final. <laughs> There'll be other things, though. All right. Then you do the math and you take. 7.8, uh, where's my calculator? Now, 7.8 times 30 divided by 0.5. That equals 468 milliliters. Now, I guarantee you, even though I'm saying this and I go over it, I'll bet you 40 to 50% of the class put that as the answer. That is not the answer. Okay. That is the total volume. That's not what the question asked. The question is, how much water do you add? You have to end up with 468 milliliters of solution. You started with 30 milliliters of solution. So you had to add 438 milliliters of water. That's what the question is asking you. You're adding 438 milliliters to give you a total volume of 468 for your final dilution. So do not forget to do this last step because I guarantee you both those answers are gonna be on the final. It's gonna be a multiple choice and you're gonna see both those answers. So don't forget to answer the question I'm asking you, not just what you wanna tell me. 
I know it's a total volume of 468, but I don't know how much water you're adding to it. So you're adding, you're gonna measure 438 milliliters to get to a volume of 468. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so no one here is gonna miss this on final, right? Right? Sorry. <laughs> Let's hope the anxiety doesn't kick in. Have anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one formula. Just remember, it's asking you how much water you're adding, not how much volume you're going to end up with at the end. Remember what your formula is. Your formula is your molarity and your total volumes. What your total volume starts with, what your total volume is at the end. Okay? So hopefully everybody gets that one right. Yeah, how did you get from the 468 milliliters to the 438 um, milliliters of H2O? Okay. Sure. So we know Minus. what our total volume is 468, right? Yeah. We know we started with 30 milliliters. So we started with 30, so we subtract 30 from that. That gives you 438. Because if I add 438, I've already got 30. My total volume is going to be 468. Right? I've got to end right. up 438 milliliters. I started with 30, so I'm only adding 438 milliliters to it. Okay, that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay, oh, no problem. All right, second part, 11.2. We are talking about electrolytes. We already talked about electrolytes before, how they dissolve in water. Okay, so we took on, we can do an ulti. You come here to watch. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about electrolytes here. We look, electrolytes are by uh, ionic compounds that dissolve in water or a, a solution. So, you know, like NaCl, when you do a salt solution, it dissolves to Na plus and Cl minus. Magnesium bromide dissolves to magnesium 2 plus plus 2 Br minuses. Okay, we talked about that before. Those are electrolytes that dissolve in a solution. Okay, we can use that as our equations, like we're doing with molarity. So, if we have a one molar solution of magnesium bromide, we're gonna have one molar magnesium ion, and we're gonna have two molar bromine ion, okay? Because it breaks out, because every one MgBr breaks into one magnesium and two bromines. So just like in a chemical equation, we had one mole of bromine goes to one mole of magnesium plus two moles of bromine. Molarity is the same way. It's gonna break into the moles for electrolyte. So if we had calcium, calcium acetate, CA, C, it's acetate, C2H3, C2H3O, okay, two. Okay, we'd have one calcium and two acetate ions. So if this was five molar, this would be five molar calcium. This would be 10 molarity acetate. It's the same ratio from one to two. So if we start with, okay, where we start with, we're gonna use as that dissolves in solution. So magnesium bromine, if we started with seven molar, we'd have seven molar magnesium. And how many bromine would we have? What would be the concentration of bromine? For this right here. If I had seven molar magnesium bromide, what be the concentration of bromine ion in solution? If I had one, it would be two, right? If I had two, it would be four. If I had seven, it would be 14. Because okay. every one gives you two. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. No. Okay, good. Cool. I'm the designated okay. person to answer. <laughs> All right, so let's do. Okay, let's do from a sample in your book. Let's say it says write an ionic equation, which we're good at now. We've written those before. 
showing the ions form when ammonium phosphate, let me first look at what ammonium phosphate is. Ammonium phosphate is ammonium, NH4, and that'd be three times, and then phosphate, because PO4 is negative three. So that's ammonium phosphate. So when ammonium phosphate dissolves in water, what is the concentration of ammonium and the phosphate ions in a point 0.928 molar solution? Now that's a, that's a good test question too. I think I went just like that on the test. Okay, so we have a 0.928 molar solution of ammonium phosphate. We wanna know the concentration of ammonium ion. Remember I told you concentrations are brackets. So we wanna know the concentration of ammonium ion and the concentration of, that's a question mark, phosphate. Okay, so write the ionic equation, NH4, ammonium phosphate, dissolves in water to form the ammonium ion, there's three of them, and a phosphate ion. Okay, so far so good, we see how that broke up. We've done all this before. This is nothing new yet. So we take a ammonium phosphate where concentration is 0.928. Okay. We know the concentration of phosphate is 0.928. Okay. It's one to one, one ammonium phosphate goes to one phosphate and one ammonium phosphate goes to three ammoniums. So we take 9.28. times three, and that comes out to 2.78. So there's your molarity, there's your molarity, and there's your molarity. So a molar, a solution of ammonium phosphate, that's 0.928 molarity, is gonna give you a solution of 0.278 molarity ammonium ions, and 0.928 molar solution of the phosphate ion. Make sense? Yes, yeah. it does. Okay, that's the, the same thing we do with balanced chemical equations. Okay, so we got that, we got that. Let's see, I don't want to do that one in total moles. All right, now we're going to get into colligative properties. Colligative properties depend upon, it doesn't matter what type of salt you have, it just means how many parts it's breaking into. Like we saw ammonium phosphate broke into three ammoniums and one phosphate, it broke into four parts. So colligative properties are determined by the parts in the solution themselves, okay? We got two things, we got, we got, we got four things we're looking at actually. But well, first two are gonna be our freezing point and our boiling point, okay? When parts dissolve in a solution, the boiling point increases, the freezing point decreases. Okay. So when they take salt and they pour it on the roads during the wintertime when it snows, not twenty nine bombs, but when it snows back east or snows at the mountains of Big Bear, they pour salt on the roads, right? What that does, it lowers the freezing point. So instead of ice forming at 32 degrees, it has to get a lot colder than that for ice to form on the roads. So it's safer to drive on. So when you add something with the colligative property, which means a number of ions, it lowers your freezing point. And the same thing with the boiling point. If you're a backpacker or a hiker, I used to backpack a lot when I was younger. Okay. We'd always go above the timberline. The timberline is 14,000 feet. You go above the timberline, you, can't boil, you cannot boil an egg in water anymore because water boils at such a low temperature because of the decreasing pressure above the timberline. So water, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade down at sea level. Yeah, you go up 14,000 feet, water boils like 80 degrees centigrade and it doesn't, it's not enough to boil an egg. So you have to add something to the water, we add salt. You drop salt in the water and it raises the boiling point. So the boiling point now goes up to 100 degrees and you can boil an egg now. Okay. So when you cook, there's different, like every notice when you have when you're cooking things, there's different directions for your different elevations, like making cakes and stuff, or cupcakes or cookies. There's different directions for your different elevations. What you add, 
because the boiling point and freezing points are different. So the things you need to know is the more ions in solution, the lower the freezing point. The more ions in solution, the greater the boiling point, they expand. So your boiling point goes up, the freezing point goes down, you get a bit larger range. Those are the, the two first colligative properties. Can you repeat that, doctor? Sure, which, uh, as, as, as you the add things- ions? Okay, yeah. sorry. No, 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 you're fine. As you have a solution, okay? Uh, the more ions you add, like say sodium and chlorine, the more you add, the higher your boiling point goes and the lower your freezing point goes. Okay. So say we had water. Water boils at 100 degrees centigrade and it freezes at zero degrees centigrade. If we add salt to the water, the freezing point gets lower, the boiling point gets higher because there's more obstacles in the way for the water to boil and release into the gas phase. Same with the freezing point. There's more things in the way so the molecules can't come together and freeze. And it all depends on the number of ions in solution. It doesn't matter what type of ions. So I'll give you an example. We have sodium chloride, breaks into one sodium and one chlorine. That's gonna give you a certain Freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. If we had uh, magnesium chloride, breaks into one magnesium and two chlorines. This gives you a total of two ions of solution. This gives you a total of three because there's two chlorines and one magnesium. The one with the most ions, which would be this one compared to the two, is going to give you the higher freezing point elevation, and the lower freezing point depression. It's going to bring it down. It's going to make a big, a more profound effect. So you get a more profound effect depending on the number of ions released in the solution. Okay, that's how antifreeze work. That's how uh, salt works on the roads to prevent uh, freezing on the roads. So let's give you an example. Let's do example from your book, 11.9, if you want to follow along with that. It says, which solution is going to have the lower freezing point? So which solution of these three listed is going to have the lower freezing point? Remember, freezing point depression, it gets lower boiling point elevation. And your three solutions are going to be three molar, Sodium carbonate. That's one. And or the other one's a two molar aluminum chloride. Okay. So which one of those two solutions is going to have the lowest freezing point? The aluminum chloride. Right? Let's, let's, calculate, let's calculate and find out. Okay. So sodium carbonate. Okay. Goes into two NAs plus one carbonate. Okay. And this is three molar. Okay. So this is six molar. And this is three molar, right? Because it's, there's two sodiums for every one sodium carbonate. So six molar. So that gives a total of 9.0 molar when we add these together. That's what's in solution. And we got two molar aluminum chloride. Aluminum chloride goes into Al three plus plus three Cl minuses. And this is 2.0. So this is 2.0 aluminum, and this is times three, because it's 6.0, right? Because it's three times the amount of aluminum chloride. So we add these together, that gives us 8.0 molarity solution. Which solution has a higher molarity? Sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Sodium carbonate. Carbonate, sorry. <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> I agree with you, so it's okay. <laughs> 
So the 3.0 mold solution of sodium carbonate is going to have a lower freezing point and a higher boiling point. It's going to lower the freezing point by this 9 molar. And this is going to raise the boiling point by the 9 molar right also. It's the number of ions in solution in the concentration. Okay. And that's a, those are called colligative properties. It depends on the total amount of the molarity. How many ions are suspended in the solution? Okay. Let's do another one here. Let's do one more example of this one. They'll go into osmotic pressure. Okay. We're going to give you three solutions. We're going to give you two molar. Okay. <laughs> Two molar magnesium sulfate. We're going to give you two molar calcium, uh, potassium carbonate. And we're going to give you 3.2 molar ammonium chloride. And which has the uh, lowest freezing point and which has the highest freezing point. We're looking for freezing points. Okay. So let's do our, our magnesium sulfate goes to Mg2 plus plus SO4 2 minus. And this is going to be a two molar. And this is going to be a two molar. So we're going to have a total of 4.0 molar, right? Everybody see what I'm doing there? It's just one-to-one -one doing our balanced chemical equation. How did you get the number of, mol of moles? Is it because right of the... Right here. It's the two-molar solution. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So it, it's one-to-one. -one. So if it, it starts with two moles of that, goes to two moles of magnesium, two moles of sodium sulfate, just like in our, our chemical equations. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay, so potassium carbonate goes to two potassiums plus one carbonate. Okay, so we have two molar. This is going to be four molar. This is going to be two molar because we're double that one. It's in a one to two ratio or one to one ratio. And that gives you a total of six molarity for your total solution. Add those together. And then ammonium chloride goes to one NH4 plus ammonium plus CO minus. And again, that's 3.2. That's 3.2. That gives you a total of 6.4. So which one has the lowest freezing point? Which solution? Magnesium. Third one. Right. Well, perfect. Third one, ammonium, uh, ammonium chloride. Okay, this would have the lowest freezing point. What would have the highest freezing point? The highest freezing point is going to be the one least one. affected. Which would be the top one, right? Magnesium sulfate. This would have the highest freezing point. And for boiling point, it'd be the exact opposite. The highest boiling point would be here. The lowest boiling point would be here. These are the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay, because it raises the boiling point and it lowers the freezing point. So the greater the number is the greater amount you're going to lower the freezing point. The greater the number can be the higher the amount for the boiling point it goes up. It's going to elevate the boiling point to the highest. So the change is going to be greater. Okay, so freezing point goes down. Boiling point goes up. All right, makes sense? Yeah. All right. Then we talk about osmotic pressure. It's another colligative property. Osmotic pressure is water is going to flow from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration to equalize the pressure. In other words, if we have, let's say we have a cylinder here, and this is what's called a semi-permeable membrane. Now your red blood cells 
have a semi-permeable membrane, which means water can flow in and out of red blood cells. The water molecules can pass through here. So let's make a, a concentrations here. And we'll start adding solutions across here. We're going to add these solute molecules. Okay. Now you see these solute molecules are too big to pass through the, the membrane. But water can pass through them. So this is our higher concentration, high concentration. This is our low concentration of our solute particles. Okay. Now, it's going to flow towards equilibrium. It wants to make the same concentration. So water is going to flow from the right side to the left side through these, because our water molecules are tiny. Those are our water molecules. Okay, and the water molecules can pass through that membrane. So this will dilute the left side to make the concentration equal. So this water will rise up on this side of the membrane. And this one will go down until the, until the concentrations are equal. Okay? So solute particles cannot flow through a semi-permeable membrane. Only water molecules can flow through there. So that's how your red blood cells work in the body, because they're going to go. They're going to respond to different types of concentrations. That's why transfusions, like Ringer's solution, have to match your your concentration of red blood cells. Ringer solution is I, any IV solution has to match the concentration, or else the water is going to flow in different directions. So you understand how water is going to flow to equalize that. So this is going to go up. This one's going to go down. The force that that pushes up with, that's called osmotic pressure. That's what osmotic pressure is, is the force of water flowing. So water flows from a solution of low concentration to a solution of high concentration. Does that make sense? A lot of people get confused with that. But you got to remember the solute particles, the large particles, can't pass through the membrane. So if we got a red blood cell, okay, this is our red blood cell. And it has a certain concentration of proteins and things inside of it. And these solute particles cannot pass through the membrane. Now, if we give someone an IV, and that IV solution has more particles than the red blood cell, what's going to happen? This is what we have on the outside of that red blood cell. We have a whole lot of particles. So water is going to flow to make those equal. So it has to dilute the outside to make it equal. So water flows out of your red blood cells. Okay. This is called a hypertonic solution. Water flows out, your red blood cells shrivel up and die. They shrivel up, they can't function, your patient dies. So you never give a patient a hypertonic solution, IV, if you want to, if we want them to survive. It has to match the red blood cells. Same on the other one, if you give them a hypotonic, in other words, here's your red blood cells. These are the solute particles inside the red blood cells. And we give them a solution in the IV that has very few little dots in here. Okay. Water is going to equalize that. They want both concentrations to be the same. So water has to flow in to dilute what's inside the red blood cells to keep the concentrations equal. The red blood cell water goes in and in and in, and the red blood cell bursts and explodes from all the water coming in, and your patient dies. This is a hypotonic solution, okay? When we first started doing IVs, this is how we realized something was going wrong. You can't just give someone a concentration that is greater than a red blood cell or less than a red blood cell. Okay, you have to do what's called an isotonic solution. Here's your red blood cell, and we got the same concentration. Water flows out, water flows in at the same rate because it's a semi-permeable membrane, and this is isotonic. Isotonic solution is a 0.9% Rieger solution. They calculate it out, they put it on your IV, so you're giving them an isotonic solution of electrolytes and balances to restore the patient back to health, like dehydration, things like that, you're giving them an isotonic solution. 
That way the red blood cells don't shrink up and shrivel up and die, and they don't blow up and, ex and explode. Okay? You have to match that solution or your patient's not gonna be happy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. All right. That's why. I, that's why. That's why you're everything you hang on an IV bag on that little label that you read will give you a percentage solution. And it's already you don't have to do the calculation, but it's already calculated to be isotonic with your blood cell in the with, with red blood cells. Okay. So hyper hypertonic is too much. Saw you particles around the blood cell. Hypotonic is too little. Hypertonic, the red blood cell shrivels up, and becomes non-functional. Hypotonic, all the water goes in, the red blood cell expands, expands, expands until it blows up. Isotonic, water comes in and out at the same rate with no change. And your patient's much happier that way. Okay. And... Let's see. Let's do one more question here, then we'll go to the next section. So what solution has a higher osmotic pressure? One molar magnesium, excuse me, molar magnesium acetate or two molar sodium acetate? Okay, so we have two solutions. Okay, we have 1.0 molar. Uh, magnesium acetate. Magnesium acetate is Mg C2H3O twice. Okay, magnesium acetate. And we have sodium acetate. 2.0, we have a 2.0 molar solution of sodium acetate. And that's H5, I'm sorry. Doesn't make a difference, that's H5. All right, so which one has the, which is have the greater osmotic pressure? And osmotic pressure is pi. That's what, that's what the symbol for osmotic pressure is. Okay. So magnesium acetate breaks into Mg2 plus, plus two acetate, C2, C2, H5, O, negative. Okay, so this is one molar. And this is two molar. Gives you a total of 3.0 molar of ions in solution. That's your ion concentration. Okay, sodium acetate. That gives you one sodium and one acetate. So that's two molar. So this one's gonna be two molar. And this is gonna be two molar. That gives you 4.0 molar. So which one of those two solutions is gonna have the greater osmotic pressure? Would it be the first one? Which one? The uh, 3.0. Which one has a greater number? 4.0. Lower point zero. The more parts in the solution, the stronger the osmotic pressure, the more the water is going to flow one direction or the other to equalize it. So the higher your number, the more parts in the solution, the greater your osmotic pressure is going to be. The more it's going to push up that solution. So this would have the greater osmotic pressure, the higher the number. The more particles you have dissolved, just like freezing points and boiling points. The more particles you have, the higher the boiling point goes. The more particles you have, the lower the freezing point goes. The more particles you have, the higher the osmotic pressure goes. It increases the effects of the colligative property. It's all right. All right. And then we have precipitation reactants, which we have already done. So we should be really good at this one. Okay. So this is the, what we've done before. These are precipitation reactants. 
All right, so we have, we have the molecular formula. Let's do silver nitrate. Go right with the book you can follow it. Silver nitrate plus potassium chloride goes to silver chloride and potassium nitrate. These are all aqueous solutions, AQ, AQ. This is a solid, that's an S, and this is aqueous. All right, that's your molecular formula. Remember, I want you to be able to write three types of formulas, your molecular formula, the total ionic equation, and the net ionic equation. Okay, make sure your equation is balanced. One silver, one silver, one NO3, one NO3, one potassium, one potassium, one chlorine, one chlorine. So it's balanced. So now it's breaking into ions. Just as we did before, everything breaks into ions. That is aqueous. So AgNO3 goes to Ag plus plus NO3 minus. Okay. And potassium goes to potassium and Cl minus, AgCl solid, does not dissolve because it's a solid. And how do we know it's a solid? Solubility. Um, I lost my page here. It probably could print precipitation table, right? The solubility chart. Let me put it back up here. So we had Ag. NO3 plus KCl goes to AgCl plus potassium nitrate. And we know this is a precipitate on our solubility table. If we look at the solubility table, okay, we look at silver and we find nitrate. Silver nitrate is right here, right? Nitrate. And this is aqueous and shit. But you look at your, when we do the test, you have so you'll be a, a, you'll be an S there for solid for the precipitate. Let's just fix it on that table. Okay. So we have a solid. The others are aqueous. So let's break down to Ag plus plus NO3 minus plus K plus plus CO minus, right? Those are your ions. AgCl stays your solid. And then K plus plus NO3 minus. Okay, so there's your balanced molecular equation at the top, your total ionic equation below it, and then the net ionic equation is going to be removing your spectator ions. Spectator ions are potassium and NO3 minus. So your total, your net ionic equation is going to be Ag plus plus CL minus goes to AgCl solid. Okay. Those, are, those are your ionic equations. And we've, we've done that before in the other chapters. So this is kind of a review here. Okay. And you also have acid-base neutralization. We have an acid and a base gives you a salt and water. So let's take an acid. Let's go, our acid is, I say, hydrochloric acid, HCl, reacts with our magnesium hydroxide, our base, okay? And it's gonna produce our salt, which is gonna be MgCl, magnesium chloride, plus water. Remember, H and OH combine to form water. Now, that's not balanced. So it's balanced, it's you have to put a, we got two, three extra hydrogen, we got four there, and four here, two HCLs, that should balance, right? Magnesium, two chlorines, four hydrogens, and two oxygens. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so that is our molecular formula. Remember, water is a liquid, so all the other aqueous, and this is a liquid. 
So we have our total ionic equation, which is H plus plus Cl minus, two H pluses plus two Cl minuses goes to one Mg2 plus plus two OH minuses. Okay, so we've broken apart the top, the left side. And then we have Mg2 plus plus two Cl minuses plus two H2Os. Okay, because H2 doesn't associate. So spectator ions, magnesium and chlorine. So our net reaction is H plus plus OH minus goes to H2O. Because we can divide two on both sides and get, get rid of the twos. Okay, and that's our delusion. Remember, that is our uh, neutralization reaction. An acid in the base forms a salt and water. And the net ionic equation is hydro H plus plus OH minus goes to H2O. The rest are spectator ions. Okay. Let's do one example from your book here. And that way you can try to do the molecular. Predict the problems of the following reactions. Okay, let's do lead nitrate. Lead nitrate plus What's the code? magnesium chloride. To the storage unit. No Seven idea. ones. No clue. It was written it was in your phone in the text. Huh? I don't remember. It was a phone in your text, though. I, I don't remember it at all. Six, nine, three, three. Where's the key to it? The lock. In your car? Yeah. And then compared to Kater, Kater. All right. So we have lead nitrate and magnesium chloride. And it wants to predict the products, how much you get the total and the net, the net ionic equation. Okay. So what's it going to be? Remember, you're going to separate your plus and minus charges. So when you're predicting these, this is the positive side and the negative side. Positive side, negative side, positive side, negative side. And we're going to switch. We're going to take this positive and combine with this negative. We take this positive, combine with this negative. Okay. So you're going to form lead, chloride, PbCl2, and you're going to form magnesium nitrate. Okay. Lead chloride is a precipitate. This is our solid over here. Everything else is aqueous. So in writing this, and is well, first we got to balance it. So let's balance it. Uh, one lead, one lead, two chlorines, two chlorines, one magnesium, one magnesium, two NO3. It's balanced. That was easy. Okay. Then we're going to make our total ionic equations. We'll break everything that's not a solid. We're going to break it into ions. Okay. So we have lead two plus plus two NO3 minus. That one breaks apart. Magnesium chloride. Goes to Mg2 plus plus two chlorines, chlorides. Lead chloride is a precipitate on your solubility chart, does not break apart. It's a solid. And then Mg breaks apart, Mg2 plus to two and all three minus. There's your total ionic equation. Your net ionic equation you're going to have. You're going to cancel your spectator ions. Is magnesium, magnesium, nitrate, nitrate. So your total, or your, I'm sorry, your net ionic equation is going to be lead two plus plus two Cl minus goes to lead chloride. So you're given this part, and you can predict everything else and predict from that your total. Your, your final net ionic equation. Okay? Like I said, this, that's review for any other chapter. We've been doing that all along. Any questions on that one? No, sir. No. All right, perfect. 
And then one last section. Last section is stoichiometry. So with all this information, we can do math. <laughs> we can do problems here. All right, so. Let's take one of our balance equation. And let's see how we're gonna use this. Let's do example. What's a good example to do here? Okay. Let's do the one here that says calcium and carbonate ions react, combine the precipitation reaction by the net ionic equation. The net ionic equation, the net ionic equation is calcium plus carbonate goes to calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Okay, so there's your equation. And we need to balance it and we're balanced. So that part's easy. So it says you have this equation. It says if you, 25 milliliters. So this is what we have. We have 25 milliliters, okay? of a solution that contains 0 0.0015 molar calcium ion, okay? Reacts with excess is carbonate, so we have enough carbonate, so the limiting reaction is gonna be calcium because it says we have excess carbonate. How many grams of calcium carbonate are gonna be formed? So if we have 25 milliliters of a 0 0.0015 molar solution of calcium ion and a whole bunch of carbonate floating around, so that's not gonna limit it, how many grams of calcium carbonate are we gonna form? Okay, simple enough, right? All right, so what we have to do is convert, to use a chemical equation, we have to convert everything into what? Means it could be grams, milliliters, moles. We always, always go to moles. It's a molar representation. That tells me one mole of calcium ions combines with one mole of carbonate ions to produce one mole of calcium carbonate. So we gotta to convert to moles. So we have 25 milliliters of 0 0.0015 molar solution. So we start with 25 milliliters. And molarity, molarity is moles per liter, right? So we have to convert to liters. We can't use milliliters. So we convert milliliters to liters. Milliliters, milli is 10 to the minus three liters. And then our molarity. Molarity is moles per liter. We have 0 0.0015 moles of calcium ion per liter. That's what our molarity says, right? And that gives us moles. Now we look at our equation. This is moles of calcium. Now we know one mole of calcium gives us how many moles of calcium carbonate? It's one to one. Okay, now we got moles of calcium carbonate. Now I realize that one mole of calcium carbonate to one mole doesn't change the equation at all. One over one doesn't change your answer. But when you go back to check it, I put everything so you can look at it. So you can see the milliliters cancel, see the liters cancel, see the moles of calcium cancel, and I look moles of calcium carbonate. And you want to convert that to grams of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate, you need the molecular weight. We have one calcium, we have one carbon, and we have three oxygens. Carbon is 12. Oxygen is 16, 16, 16, 32, 42, 48. And calcium was 40. Where's my, look up calcium here. Calcium, calcium's right here at 40. 40.1, that's okay, 40. We'll go with 40. Okay, so calcium is 40. Okay, so the molecular weight is 100 grams per mole. 100 grams calcium carbonate. That's how you set it up. We're using molarity as a conversion. 
It allows it to convert from our milliliters into liters, into moles. And from moles, we can use our chemical equation to do our calculations. So we have got, let's do 25 times 0 0.0015, 0 0.0015, times one divided by one is five times 100. I get 3.75 times 10 to the negative 3. Did I do that right? Okay. And that becomes 0 0.00375 grams of calcium carbonate. Make sense? Yes. We just kind of pulled everything together there. Let's see where we're at. Uh, all right, let's do one more. And this time we'll put different rules into position here. We'll do molarity, we'll do some more gas laws that we learned. So this is example 11.3 in your book. And then we'll finish, this will finish the chapter, I think. So, let's clear that. It says, calcium metal reacts with aqueous hydrobromic acid to produce calcium bromide and hydrogen gas. What volume of 2.5 molar of hydrogen, um, of hydrogen bromide is required to produce two liters of hydrogen gas at a temperature of 298 Kelvin and a pressure of 1.20 atmospheres. Okay, whole bunch of words. Let's just come into chemistry. So it says calcium metal. Calcium metal is Ca. That's calcium metal. Plus hydrobromic acid, HBr. React to form calcium bromide. Calcium is plus two, bromine is minus one. So Ca, Br2 using crisscross and hydrogen gas, okay? We just converted English into chemistry. All right, so now we need to balance our equation. We have one calcium, one calcium, two bromines, make this two bromines, two hydrogens, two hydrogens. Now we're balanced, okay? So we got a balanced chemical equation, and we put our numbers that we have. We're looking for the volume of HBr. So what volume? Question mark volume of 2.50 molar HBr. What volume of 2.50 molar is required to produce 200 liters of hydrogen gas? 200 liters. 200.0 liters at a temperature of 298 Kelvin and a pressure of 1.20 atmospheres. Okay, that's everything we got now is written down in front of us. So we need to calculate, we have to get to moles to use a chemical equation. When in doubt, go to moles. To use any chemical equation, you have to get into moles. So we're given we're given conditions. Are any of our for let's look at the gas first. Are any of the conditions of the gas changing? Do we change the volume? Do we change the temperature? Do we change the atmosphere, the pressure? No. So what are we going to use? Are we going to use the P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2, or are we going to use PV equals NRT? Which one of the two are we going to use? Don't know. Don't know. Remember, I told you if you're not changing anything, use PV equals NRT. Nothing changes, you use the ideal gas law. So use PV equals NRT because nothing changes there. You're not changing pressure, you're not changing temperature. Okay? And we're going to look for the number of moles. We want to calculate the number of moles. So N 
is equal to PV over RT. So the pressure is equal to 1.20 atmospheres. The volume is 200 liters. R is equal to 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And the temperature has to be in Kelvin 298. That's going to give us moles of hydrogen. Okay, that's from the last chapter, our gas law. So 1.2 times 200. Divided by 0 0.08206. Divided by 298. Comes out to 9.81 moles of hydrogen. Hydrogen gas. Okay, so now we got moles. Now you need a chemical equation. So what are we looking for? We're looking for an HBr. You want to know how much volume of that is. So you want to figure out how many moles of hydrogen we have. So we have 9.8 moles of hydrogen gas. So Moles of hydrogen gas, we have one mole of hydrogen gas gives us how many moles of HBr? What's our chemical equation say? One mole of hydrogen gives us two moles of HBr from our balanced chemical equation. So now I want to look for the volume. I have moles of HBr. I know I have 2.50 moles per liter. So we have got 2.50 moles per liter. That's what molarity means, right? 2.50 moles per liter. And that's our volume. That gives us our volume. So then you just do the math. You do 9.81. times two divided by 2.5. That comes out to 7.85 liters of HBr. And that's what they're asking for. So you can combine the gas laws, you can combine the molarity, and we combine our stoichiometry into different equations. We do limiting reagents. It all comes down to knowing the conversions and being able to end up with the, the units that you want. You want it in liters. So if you're given this information of a gas, you convert to moles. If you're given the information in a liquid, like molality, you convert it to moles. If you're given it in grams, you convert to moles. And then you can use your chemical equation and convert to what you need. You have to get to moles. Okay? So in order to use the chemical equation to give your ratios, you have to convert it to moles. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Good, perfect. Because you gotta, gotta, gotta get to moles. Where is my, where's my mouse? There it is. All right, perfect. That is the end of that chapter. All right, any questions on this chapter? I know I got some questions that people emailed in and. Uh, on cell phone and stuff like that too. So we'll start to go over those. Any particular questions on this chapter so far? No, but I do no. have a question. Okay. So are we supposed to cover, did we just cover chapter 11? 11. And, yep. 11 and 12? Not that I know, just 11. Okay. Yeah, solutions, what was chapter 12? Let me look here. Yeah, chapter 12 was acids and bases. Okay. Okay, so we did chapter, we're, we're on chapter 11. Okay, thank you. Oh, no problem. All right, any specific questions on this before we go to the other questions?
Let me pull it up on my phone. We have some questions here. Uh, where did we go? Here we are. All right. We got about one, two, three, four, five, six, several questions here. All right. First question says, complete and balance the molecular equation for the reaction of aqueous chromium 2 bromide, which is CrBr2, and aqueous sodium carbonate. So it says complete the balanced molecular equation for chromium 2 bromide. So we have Cr Br2. Okay. This remember the Roman numeral is for the let's see something. Yeah, here we go. Oops, got my pencil. Okay, so chromium 2 bromide plus what did it say? And sodium carbonate. Okay, those are both aqueous. And remember how we do that? We divide it. This is our positive side. Oops, what did I do? Positive side, negative side. The pencil not working right. Positive side, negative side. And we're going to switch. The positive combines with the negative. Positive combines with the negative. The pencil's acting up. Okay. So what do I do? Here we go. So we're going to have chromium. And it's going to combine with carbonate. And we're going to have sodium combining with bromine. So far, so good. Now we got to balance it. Because Cr has a plus 2, chromine has a minus 2. Na is plus 1, Br is minus 1. And we have two bromines. We've got to put a 2 in front of here. Jeez, why is my pencil working like that? Two so um, so two sodiums, two sodiums, two bromines, two bromines, one carbonate, one carbonate, one chromium, one chromium. As balanced. So there's your balanced chemical equation. I think that was the first part. And the physical states would be uh, chromium carbonate is a solid, I believe. Chromium carbonate. Look on our chart here. Let's go to chromium. We don't have chromium on the charts. We have to look at. You have to look at a different table. So you look in your book, you see the the, the table with the rules for uh, solubility, and this is a solid, and this is aqueous, aq. Okay. And it says right, enter the balanced net ionic equation. Okay, the balanced net ionic equation would be you write this out: chromium two plus plus 2 Br minus, plus 2 Na plus, plus CO3 2 minus. That's the left side. The right side is your precipitate, CrCO3, and then 2 Na plus, plus 2 Br minus. Cross off your spectator ions. Okay. Your net ionic equation is Cr2 plus, plus CO3, two minus, goes to CrCO3 solid. And these are both aqueous. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, perfect. And the next one would be, write the net ionic equation, including all the phases for the reaction. It gives you the reaction. It gives you iron two um, hypochlorite F. Why is my pencil stopping to work here? 
who's in connection with a pencil. There we go. So Fe, there it is. FeClO4. So iron two. FeClO4 plus uh, lost it. K uh, potassium carbonate. goes to Fe uh, iron two carbonate plus potassium hypochlorite. Okay, and it wants a net ionic equation. Okay, and then there's, there's the phases. So you got to balance this. We put a two. Here. Put a two here. It gives you one iron, one iron, two chlorides, two chlorides, two potassiums, and one carbonate. And we're balanced. So we break this into it and remove our spectator ions. We would have Fe2 plus plus two ClO4 minus plus two K pluses plus carbonate two minus. And that goes to FeCO3, iron carbonate. This is a solid. Plus 2K plus, plus 2ClO4 minus. Get rid of your spectator ions, nickel chloride ion, potassium ion. And you're left with your net ionic equation of Fe2 plus, plus CO3, 2 minus, goes to iron 2 carbonate. And that one's a solid. The other two are aqueous. There's your net ionic equation. All right. The next one is missing something here. Hold on. Okay, those are that. And the next one says, calculate the amount of heat gained or lost by the solution, the specific, but doesn't tell what the solution is. It's missing that one. But it says, calculate the molar heat of the solution of potassium hydroxide. It's, we're missing, on that we're missing information. We'll do that a little bit later. It says, calculate the heat gained by the solution. So, I mean, heat gained is Q. As you equal to specific heat M delta T. So I need that information. Or Q equals the heat capacity times delta T. So we're looking for the heat capacity or specific heat. Those are two equations you would use. But I need, I need the information above it. It doesn't have it on the question here to be able to do that question. So one, two, three. The next one is use the heat of the solution interactive to calculate the molar heat of potassium hydroxide. First, you record the mass of the water and the mass of potassium hydroxide. Well, maybe these are backwards. Okay, it says the mass of water. Let's clear this here. I see. So the mass of water is equal to 70. So the mass of potassium hydroxide. is equal to five. I assume these are grams, right? Grams, yeah. Okay. Uh, record the temperature change of the solution. When you add those together, the temperature change of the solution is 17.55. Okay, so now that's the information needed for the first one. So let's go back and it says, calculate the heat gained or lost by the solution. The specific heat of water is Q, is uh, 4.184. So you want Q value, Q is equal to, it's 
specific heat M delta T. And that was a temperature change of the water, right? Go back and make sure of the solution. Okay. So the, the, the Q value, the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree centigrade. The mass of the water, what is this? It's 4.18. Uh, yeah, it's 4.18. Okay, 4.18, same, same thing, yeah. They just, they left off one of the numbers, that's okay. We need 4.18 joules per gram degree centigrade. And the heat gained or lost by the solution. Okay, so the solution is the mixture of the two. So the mass of the solution is 75 grams. See, they're making an assumption here. They're not telling you. They're assuming that the, the specific heat of water doesn't change with the addition of potassium hydroxide. So there's a massive solution, and the temperature change is 17.55. So your value, your heat change, heat transferred, is equal to 4.24 times 75 times 17.55. So it's going to be roughly five, five, zero, seven joules. So 5.5, 5, where are we at? It's significant figures, roughly 5.51 kilojoules is the heat that's going to be gained from the solution. Because it's specific heat, which we have this heat of water, the mass of the water and the potassium hydroxide and the change in temperature. Okay. We're just making the assumption that when you add the potassium hydroxide, this value doesn't change. They should have said that in the, in the thing. Yeah, sometimes their wording is confusing, so I don't know what they're asking. Yeah, yeah. that's what it's asking, okay? It says the heat gained or lost by the solution. Okay. It says calculate the molar heat of the solution. So how many moles of potassium hydroxide we have? We have five grams of potassium hydroxide. The molecular weight of potassium hydroxide is 56, and this gives you the exact 56.105 grams per mole. That would give you moles of potassium hydroxide. So we take moles, and do they want it in, let's see if they want it, kilojoules per mole, okay, fine. So they wanted that in kilojoules. And then this would be five divided by 56.105, comes out to 0 0.0891 moles. Of potassium hydroxide. So we have this many kilojoules right here per 0 0.0891 moles. That gives you the molar heat, that gives you kilojoules per mole. So it would be 5.51 divided by point, point 0 0.0891. Ah, wow, keep it the wrong numbers. Equals, so it looks like it's 0 0.162 hey, kilojoules per mole. Steve, what? where's, where's Nana? I don't know. Go, go play. I don't know. 1.62 kilojoules per mole is the molar capacity of that change. So those are the two things that you wanted. Okay. We'll go back to where is that? Okay, so I'll make sure you answer those. They wanted the heat gained or loss, which is 5.51 kilojoules. And they wanted the molar heat of the solution, which is divided by how many moles you had in kilojoules per mole, which is 0.162. Does that make so sense? I said it's wrong What's for that? the last one. I said that it's wrong for the last one. Okay, that might be a little bit different because it depends on the same figures. 
what you have to do. Okay, that's how you do it. Okay, Wait, is the top is the five point five one kilojoules right? Yeah. Okay, then it's just be three significant digits. It should be kilojoules per mole. It can't be wrong uh, unless they're maybe it's point two. I mean, they only had one significant digit, digit here. It said five grams. Was it 5.0 grams, 5.00? Because if they want one significant digit, this would be 0 0.2. Depends on how many digits they have in it. But it's five, it's because they gave you this, they gave you, they gave them at 56.105, and it was, it was five grams, right? For the numbers that we had. So it just said five grams. I don't know if it's 5.0, 5.1. So it might be two, it might be one centimeter, it might be four centimeter digits, depending on the measurements. Okay, but that's how to set it up, because this is double check the math on that. Five divided by 56.105. Yeah, 0.0891. Okay, and it's 5.51 divided by 0 0.162. 34. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I can never the answer that. Did I do my math wrong? 5.51 divided by 0 0.0891. 61.8. Whoa, I got a whole different answer. I'm going to say something wrong on my calculator. Yeah, always check my math. 5.51 divided by 0.9 comes to 61.8 kilojoules per mole. Yeah, I don't know how I got that answer. I'm going to say something wrong on my calculator. Got to watch my calculator buttons. <laughs> okay, now, that might work through my three digits. Because I, I just I just hit the one button to calculator. All right. Yeah, let's check. Okay, does that make sense? That yeah, does, thank you. Okay, no problem. Okay, let me read this. It says potassium nitrate. Next one says potassium nitrate has a molar mass of 101.3. So potassium nitrate and 101.3 grams per mole. Constant pressure calorimeter, you have 12.3 grams. 12.3 grams. Okay, is dissolved in 287 grams of water. So 200 grams is dissolved in 287 grams of water. So 12.3 grams potassium nitrate is dissolved in 287.3 grams of water at 23 degrees centigrade. Okay, that's what we're starting with. The temperature resulting solution decreased to 20.8. So it went down to 20.80. Assume the resulting solution has the same specific heat as water. Maybe the heat lost to the surroundings. How much heat was released by the solution? Okay, so the solution Q. Equals specific heat m delta t. So q is equal to the specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree centigrade. Mass was mass of water plus the mass of potassium. About the solution, right? How much is used by the solution? 
Okay. So the mass is 287, 297, 299.3 grams for our solution. Grams of water, grams of potassium nitrate. Right? Should we do that right? Yeah, I'm checking my math here. Yeah, okay. Grams. And the change in temperature was 23. minus 20.8, the difference is 2.2. That's your change in temperature. Okay, so make sure you hit the right buttons this time. 4.184 times 299.3 times 2.2 equals 2.7. 5, 4, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, Does that make sense? Yeah, it's also asking for the enthalpy. Enthalpy of the reaction, yeah. Let me pull that back up. That's my phone not going for me. I think it's time to update my phone here. It's having a hard time with. It should be right. Let me pull that back up. It's got too many things open. It's locked up. Hold on one second. We'll get this right back here. Okay, there we go. We should be able to pull that up now. Maybe that goes back to. There it went. That's your nitrate. Okay, there we go. And it wants, what is the enthalpy of the reaction? Delta H, which is, uh, the delta H is a change per mole. So it's 275 kilojoules, and it's per mole of potassium nitrate. That's your, your equation. Potassium nitrate, and yeah. so we have to know how many moles of potassium nitrate we have. So we have 12.3 grams of potassium nitrate, and how many grams per mole? And it gave us that as 101.3. So we take 12.3. Ah, I hit the wrong numbers again. 12. My numbers again. 12.3 divided by 101.3. Okay. My two is not working on my calculator. 12.3 divided by 101.3. Okay. Gives you 0.121 moles of potassium nitrate. So we have this many kilojoules, 2.75 kilojoules per mole, which is 0.121. So we this many kilojoules per mole, which would be, because we have one mole of potassium nitrate in our balanced formula, we have 2.75 divided by 0.121. 22.5. Kilojoules per mole. I think that's what they wanted. Let me double check. Make sure they wanted kilojoules per mole. Yes, they did. Okay. That should be it.
that she approved it. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect, no problem. And there's a couple more here. It says when 0.54 grams of sodium metal is added to an excess hydrochloric acid, 56, 56 10 joules of heat are produced. What is the enthalpy of the reaction? So you have, the reaction is sodium metal plus hydrochloric acid. Goes to NaCl sodium chloride plus hydrogen gas. So balance this, we have the two hydrogens. We need two chlorines. We need two sodiums. And that's balanced. And enthalpy for that reaction is, keep losing on my phone here. So it says five, six, one, zero joules is produced from that reaction. And it says we have 0 0.540 grams of sodium metal. So how many moles is that? So for that reaction, but we're doing double the mole. So sodium is 20, what's sodium? Sodium is 23 grams per mole. So 23 grams per mole. Okay, and it's gonna be 0.54. Divided by 23. That's going to equal 0 0.0235. Okay, so we have 5610 joules for every 0 0.0235 moles. So 5610 divided by 0 0.0. 235 comes out to 238723.4. And that's kilojoules. You want in kilojoules, I assume? 238, 239 kilojoules. Okay. So 239 kilojoules per mole. And if you look at the equation here, we got two moles of sodium. So two moles of sodium will be double that amount because every one mole produces that. But your balance chemical equation, you're dealing with two moles of this. So your delta H is going to equal uh, 200. Oops, where did my phone go off? 239. Just double that 478 kilojoules per mole. Because this is your molar, this is how many heats produced per mole. Okay? And you've got two moles in your balanced chemical equation right there. And that should give you your delta H your, for the equation. Let me see if that's the units they wanted in though. Oh, I did that one already, hold on. Mm -hmm. And they want it in kilojoules. Well, it's in two moles, that's right. So it's just in kilojoules. That's what that's used in. 470 kilojoules. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Oh, perfect. No problem. And it says classify each substance based on the intermolecular force present in the substance. So you want hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, or dispersion forces. And these are the ones you put on there. 
So it gives you, I assume it gives you four things. It gives you types of forces here. It gives you hydrogen fluoride, HF. It gives you CH4. It gives you CH3, Cl, coal methane, and it gives you carbon monoxide. And it wants you to tell you whether it's hydrogen bonding. Or dipole, dipole, or dispersion. This is worded really weird. It wants to know if they're dispersion only, dipole, dipole, and dispersion only, or hydrogen bonding, dipole, dipole, and dispersion. Okay, this one is hydrogen bonding right here. That's hydrogen bonding. This one is polar. So these would be, both these would be dipole, dipole. And this one is dispersion London forces. Okay, so the top one's hydrogen bonding. The CH4 is just dispersed, that's a hydrocarbon. And the other ones will have a dipole because they have polar bonds. I think that's what it's asking. Classify each substance based on the forces present in the substance. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when 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 uh hydrogen bonded nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine is hydrogen bonding, one of those three elements. CH4 has no polarity, it's just dispersion from one together. There's polar bonds in carbon um, uh, chloromethane, this is a chlorine, and the polar bond with carbon monoxide. So these are two, both these are dipole, dipole. This is dispersion, and the top one is hydrogen bonding. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect, no problem. And there's one more on the cell phone, then we'll go to the email ones. Combustion of octane, precedes and corner of the reaction shown below, CO2 and water, okay? Most of octane combusts, but volume carbon dioxide is produced. Okay, so again, we have another one of our, our, our hydrocarbons that are being burned. So that always produces carbon dioxide and water. So we have octane, which is C8, H18. Plus oxygen goes to CO2 and water. Okay, they balance it for you. They put two of these. They actually gave it two C8, H18. You can balance these two if you wanted to. And oxygen is 25. Carbon dioxide is 16. And this was 18, right? 18, yeah. All right, there's your balanced chemical equation. So the combustion of octane, according to the following reaction. Okay, 402 moles of octane. 402 moles of oxygen. We're in moles, we use our chemical equation, which is good. So 402 moles. What volume of carbon dioxide is produced? And they want to know volume. It's produced. And it's at 23 degrees centigrade. Whoops. 23 degrees centigrade, 0 0.995 atmospheric pressure. Okay, so we just see how many moles of carbon dioxide produced. So we have 402 moles of octane. And according to our balanced chemical equation, we have moles of octane. We want to go from moles of octane, moles of octane. to moles of CO2. And what's your relationship? Moles of CO2 is 16, moles of octane is two. Okay. Now I do realize that's eight to one, but I always leave it like that when I do my math so I can always go back and double check. So I can look at my chemical formula and see it says 16 and two, just to make sure I did everything right. So that's why I leave it like that. And then that's, that's as far as I want to go. I want moles of CO2. So 402 
if I mess up on the math here, but let's get my calculator out. 402 times 16 divided by 2 equals 3216 moles of CO2. All right. And now we're going to do the volume. And we're going to use a formula PV equals NRT because there's no changes. Pressure's not changing. It's at 0.995. Temperature's not changing. It's at 23 degrees centigrade. The volume is over calculating, and the number of doesn't change. So PV equals NRT, we're looking for volume. V equals NRT divided by P. Number of moles is 3216. R is 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole per Kelvin. Temperature is 23. We've got to convert temperature into what? Temperature always goes to what for gases? Kelvin. Kelvin. So 273 plus 23, so 273, be 296 Kelvin. Divided by pressure, which is 0.995 atmospheres. Atmospheres cancel, moles cancel, Kelvins cancel. You're left with liters, which is volume. This is exactly what we want. So 3216, 3216 times 0 0.08206 times 296 divided by 0.995 equals a big number, 7.85. Times 10 to the, let's see where we're at, 7.850, yeah, so four, 10 to the fourth liters. Is that right? One, two, three, four, 7.85 times 10 to the fourth liters. Okay, so you can use our gas laws. We can use the molarity for solutions. We can use the stoichiometry from regular chemistry that we learned from grams. We can all use that in combination with other, in all kinds of different combinations to get the calculations we need. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you for all the help. Oh, no problem. No problem at all. All right, let me pull, so we don't need that. Let me pull this one from my emails. Now, hold on, the size of the right this. Put this on my second screen here. All right, so we have got a couple more questions on email. All right, complete and balanced molecular equation for the reaction of aqueous sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate and aqueous nickel two chloride. Sodium carbonate and nickel two chloride. Okay, it's just different states. Okay, and what's the molecular equation and the balanced net ionic equation? Okay. So we've got nick sodium carbonate. These are like those we were doing before, which is good. It's good practice. And nickel two chloride. Because nickel is a transitional metal. Okay, so sodium carbonate, nickel two chloride, and molecular equation. Two CO3. Okay. So remember, we're going to divide them, positive and negative sides. Okay. And we're going to combine them. Positive goes with the negative, positive goes with the negative. So we're going to end up with sodium chloride plus nickel two carbonate. 
nickel two carbonate is a solid. Okay. And then NaCl is aqueous. So there's your equation. Now we have to balance it. So you have sodium two, so you put a two here. There's our two sodiums. And one carbonate, one carbonate, one nickel, one nickel, two chlorines, two chlorines. That's balanced. So that's the first step. That's your molecular equation. Okay. Let me get my screen back here so I can see. There we are. All right. Now it wants the balanced net ionic equation. So we take our ions and we have two and a plus plus CO3 two minus plus Ni two plus it's nickel two plus two CO minus close to two Na plus plus two CO minuses and Ni nickel two carbonate. The spectator ions cancel and you're left with carbonate plus nickel goes to Ni nickel carbonate. That is your balanced molecular equation. As on that, the top one's balanced molecular equation. The next one is the, the net ionic equation. Is that good? Does that make sense? Understand that one? All right. And the next one was nucleization reaction of hydrochloric acid and strontium hydroxide. Okay, so hydrochloric acid and strontium hydroxide. Strontium is, sorry, what's the charge on strontium? Strontium is right here, it's plus two. Okay. And SR hydroxide, OH2. Okay. And it wants the balanced molecular equation and net ionic equation. Okay. So it combines, we switch, we switch it out to strontium chloride plus H2O, salt and water. Acid and base form salt and water. And we have to balance that with a two here. Two, four hydrogens, four hydrogens. We put a two here. Four hydrogens, four hydrogens, two oxygens, two oxygens, one strontium, one strontium, two chlorine, two chlorine. And that's balanced. And then the net ionic equation would be for all H plus plus OH minus goes to H2O. That's enough for all neutralization reactions. <coughs> the salt, strontium, and chloride are spectator ions. So that is your net ionic equation. Okay. And we can do a couple more of these here. Single displacement reaction. This single, oh, AG, there it is, AgNO3, silver nitrate, plus aluminum, no. And again, you're gonna switch the positives, you do aluminum, Nitrate plus silver. Okay. And then you just got to balance it. This one just says balance the equation with single displacement. So we have one silver, one silver, NO3 is one NO3, one, and that's that. That's oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, AgN3, aluminum, AlNO3, three times because that's sort of plus three charge. And then this has to be a three. And this has to be a three. 
right there. So three silvers, three silvers, three and a three, two and a three, one aluminum, one aluminum. And that's balance. Okay, that's the balance equation for the single displacement reaction. And the next one. Where are we at? The next one says strontium chloride, sodium fluoride, active form, strontium fluoride, and sodium chloride. According to this reaction, what volume of point volume energy is required to react completely with? It's, it's getting duplicate things here. Let's go take and make it up. All right, so you're given this reaction. We're given strontium chloride. SRCl2 plus, and this is balanced for you, two sodium fluorides. And it goes to SRCl2 goes to strontium fluoride plus two NaCl's. Okay, so there's your equation, strontium chloride plus sodium fluoride goes to strontium fluoride plus sodium chloride. And it says, what volume of NaF, so what volume, okay, and this is 0 0.430 molar, is required. So we're looking for volume here to react with 217, 217 milliliters of 0.4 with SRCO2. Okay, so we have strontium chloride and we have 217 milliliters of 0 0.440 molar. Okay. All right. So we want to know how much of this strontium chloride is going to react with sodium fluoride, how much volume you need to completely react with that. So we can convert this into moles. So we have 217 milliliters. Okay, and molarity is in, in liters, we have to go to liters. 10 to the minus three liters. So that gives you liters and I've got 0 0.440 moles per liter. Okay, and then this is gonna be moles of strontium chloride, and I want to go to moles of NaF. And the relationship is two moles of NaF to one mole of strontium chloride. So now I got, I didn't, let me write that a little clearer. Okay, moles of SRCl2 and moles of NaF, there we go. And that is two to one. So then I got moles of NaF, and I know the, the volume of this is 0 0.430 moles per liter. So 0 0.430 moles, so point per liter. And that gives me volume. So milliliters went to liters, my liters went to moles. Moles to moles, my balance come up with equation, and I convert it back to volume with my molarity of the other solution. So I would need, and then it's 217. Where's my calculator? There it is. 217 times 0 0.440 times 2 divided by 0 0.430 equals that times 10 to the negative 3 equals 0.444. Liters or 444 milliliters, depending on what they wanted it in. Okay. It's all the same thing. There's our volume. Okay. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. Any questions on that one? So that means if it's at green and then you get away. Pretty much a lot of those are a lot of the same. Let's kind of switch and around here. It's running out some time. And, and if you want to play on it, then you get to play on it again. All right, let's go to, there's some other questions sent in here too. Let's do that, then we'll come back to those. All right, it says, label the shapes of these um, different structures. Here's the Lewis structure. Welcome to my world. C8, C8, C double bond O, if you have this Lewis structure. And hydrogen. All right, there's your Lewis structure. It wants to know the shapes at this point, which is number one, number two, number three, and number four. Okay, so number one, let's look at that shape. Let's look at the it's all label the molecular shape. Okay, you're on each central atom. Okay, so let's do the electron geometry, which I know is not the shape, and then the molecular shape. So at number one, what's the electron geometry? Electron geometry is tetrahedral. There's four yeah. charges, right? There's three bonds and the lone pair. So there's four things around it. Okay, so the shape at that is going to be Trig um, trigonal, pyramidal. Okay, if there are only three attachments to it, it'd be trigonal planar. But since there's those non-bi-electron pairs, because these make up a negative charge right here for the electron pair. So there's four negative charges. So you got this tri uh, pyramid with one charge sticking up on top of it. So the shape of number one is trigonal pyramidal. The shape at number two, there's four negative charges around it, one in each bond, okay? And there's no non bilateral pairs. So there's four bonds to it. This is gonna be tetrahedral. Number three, okay? Number three has three groups around it. No non bilateral pairs. So this is going to be trigonal planar because there's no free body electrons to distort it. And number four is going to be, there's two bonds and there's two pairs of electrons. So there's four negative charges around it, two bonds, two non electron pairs. And there's only the two bonds to form the shape. So they're going to be the angles of the, the electron geometry is tetrahedral, but the actual shape is just those two bonds, which is going to be bent. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Whoa, I think we went too far. Hold on. Uh, this one is kind of strange, but that's all right. It gives you an element here, and it shows you you have non-bonding electron pairs and then three bonds to that. So this is fluorine. This is fluorine. And this is fluorine. Okay. And it was a with fourth period element. So which fourth period element forms this compound? So it would form an extra set. So you look at that and let's go to the periodic table. And fourth period is this row here. Okay. So it would have to be two electrons and then the three pairs and the other two electrons. So if you look under that, Right. 
you have that extra pair of electrons in the second and third charge. So it would be similar to how nitrogen bonds, but you could add the extra in this column here. This would be your column that adds your extra bond. Because remember, nitrogen would be that. Okay? And if you go one, if you go below that, you have an extra p orbital to expand onto. Okay? So the the element would be arsenic. Because the other ones wouldn't form in that particular fashion. Because it forms with three bonds like nitrogen does. If it was two bonds and the extra free electrons, it'd be like oxygen. But there's three bonds and then the extra electrons like nitrogen, so it would be arsenic. Would be the answer for that. And it's kind of that's kind of a strange question. I wouldn't put anything like that on your, your test. This kind of different. But that would be the answer. Okay, the same thing here. This forms two bonds here, but it's double. So you would look in the column for, it would be under oxygen. It would be the fourth one under oxygen. So you'd look under oxygen, and this would be selenium. Again, just by how it forms, it forms two bonds. So it, for, it forms like oxygen would form. It's, I didn't write it down, I'm sorry. This is X. Okay. It forms two sets of bonds to it like oxygen does. So it'd be the fourth period for oxygen, which is selenium. Would be the answer to that one. I know these are those are really different types of questions. You know, I don't like how they're asking those. All right. Here's another good question. More math. If eight liters of water vapor at 50.2 degrees centigrade and 0.121 atmospheres react with excess iron, how many grams of iron three oxide will be produced? So your formula is iron solid plus H2O goes to iron two oxide, iron three oxide, sorry, and hydrogen gas. Okay, and they balance it for you. They put a two here, put a two here. They put a three in front of the water, put a nothing there, and a three in front of the H2O. And there's your balanced chemical equation. So you write your equation, make sure it's balanced, which it is. And then you have eight liters of water vapor. So where's our water vapor? Here's water. We have eight liters, 8.00 liters of water at 50.2 degrees centigrade and 0.121 atmospheres. Okay. Reacts with extra iron. Okay. How many grams of iron are really produced? That's what it has right there. So we've got to convert to what? To use a chemical equation, we have to convert to Mold, right? Yeah, everything has to go to moles. Okay. So this is a this is a gas a liquid. This is a gas H two O gas. So we're gonna use PV equals NRT because nothing's changing. So and we're looking for number of moles. So N equals PV divided by RT. Pressure is 0.121 atmospheres. Volume is eight liters. R is natural gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole per Kelvin. And the temperature is 50.2 Kelvin, which is 273, let's do 273, since you're good to there. 273.15 is what it actually is, plus, 50.2 comes out to 323.4 Kelvin. All right, all that cancel if there were moles. So we have 0 0.121, 0 0.121. Temperature is 
times eight divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 323.4 comes out to point zero three six four the uh, moles of water. Oh, it's five, it's five sorry. I rounded that off wrong. Point zero three six five. Okay. So now we got moles. So we got point zero three six five moles of water. So we got moles of water. And I want to go to moles of, what am I looking for? Iron three oxide. And the relationship is one mole of iron three oxide and three moles of water. And I want to go to grams. So how many grams? Per mole of iron dioxide. We have two irons. We have three oxygens. Oxygen is 1632. Yeah. I'm going to draw a point. 16, 16 is 32, 42, 48. Oxygen is 48 grams, and iron is, what is iron weigh? Iron weighs 55.8, so 56 roughly. So 56 times two is 112, right? Yeah. So that becomes 10, six, 160, roughly. Just kind of rounding those off. Yeah, so 160 grams per mole. And that gives you your Answer grams of iron peroxide we're looking for. So calculate it. We have 0 0.0365 divided by three times 160. 1.95 grams iron three oxide. Okay, thank you. Does that make sense, Stephanie? Yeah, it does. Okay, good. That was a good question. That's a really good question. All right, those are those emails. And I can go back to, there are a couple more from the other ones here. We'll do those for about 10 more minutes and we'll kind of call it a night. Let me get some good ones. Okay. These didn't come across real good here. Okay, here's a, another neutralization one. Okay, it says what volume of 0 0.2500 molar KOH is needed to react completely with 12.9 milliliters of 0.2 molar H2SO4? Okay, so we got KOH, which is our base, plus sulfuric acid. And it's going to go to potassium sulfate. Gosh, I can't write anymore. Plus water, salt and water. Right, KOH, HSO4 goes to potassium transplant. So this has to have a two. Come on, get it right. And this has to have a two, three, four hydrogens. SO4 ones, two potassiums, four hydrogens, and two oxygens. Okay, perfect. So that one's balanced. And it says the volume, you have 0 0.2500 molar. KOH. Okay. What volume is needed? So question mark volume. To react with 12.9 milliliters of 
of 0.2 molar H2SO4. Okay. So the question, question states if you have 12.9 milliliters of 0.200 molar concentration of sulfuric acid, how much, how much potassium hydroxide at 0.2500 molar do you need to react completely with it, to completely neutralize it? So we got to convert to a mole. So we take our H2SO4 and we've got 12. 0.9 milliliters, okay? And we gotta go to liters because it's got molarity. Molarity is in moles per liter. So we gotta convert that into liters. Okay. That gives us liters. And then from liters, we go to moles. We got 0 0.2, zero, zero moles per liter. And now we have to go from moles of this is moles of sulfuric acid to moles of what we're looking for, KOH. We have two moles of KOH, which will be one mole of sulfuric acid for a balanced chemical equation. And now we went and we got to go, we got moles of KOH. And now I can go to liters because I've got, I know I have 0 0.25, zero, zero moles per liter, that's my molarity. And that gives me volume. Okay, so let's go to 12.9. 12.9 times 0 0.2 times two divided by 0.25 equals that. And then times 10 to the negative three comes out to 0 0.02, 0 0.0, where the decimal point go? 206 liters. The volume you need. That's the volume of potassium hydroxide that you need to completely neutralize the H2SO4, okay? And the other reactions, just like that one, those are neutralization reactions. Zinc reacts with that. And we need to obtain from 20. Let's do another one here. Yeah. Okay. So zinc reacts with hydrochloric acid according to the following reaction. So zinc um, plus HCl goes to zinc chloride plus hydrogen. All right, let me go. I got this I'm so excited. I can't stand it. This has been so stressful, this. Okay. So zinc and hydrochloric acid go to zinc chloride plus hydrogen. So the first thing I do with the balance is to balance your chemical equation, right? So let's put two. What? We got an offer two fifty. Are we taking it? On what? On the other house. Probably. We'll take a look at it. <laughs> I told her okay. take it. Called Michael. <laughs> Michael, we might have it. Okay. They want to close it in thirty days. So we have uh, zinc chloride. Okay. So we have two chlorines, two chlorines, zinc, two ACLs. So here that should be balanced, right? One zinc, two hydrogens, two chlorines. Got it. All right. So it says how? There's your equation. How many milliliters of 0.2 molar HCl? So HCl, and it wants to know how many milliliters, and it's point, where am I at? All these got, all these got running on this email for some reason, it's hard to straighten it out. Milliliters of two molar HC, how many milliliters of two molar HCl? Okay are required to react with 5.95 grams of zinc five point nine five grams of zinc okay so there's your you got zinc react with hydrochloric acid goes to zinc chloride and hydrogen gas so how many grams of zinc are you, you're given 5.59 grams of zinc you know how many milliliters of HCl 
that's two molar is going to react with that to completely neutral to completely form the zinc chloride. Okay, so we're starting with 595, 5.95, sorry, grams of zinc, and we got to convert that into moles. Okay, so zinc is zinc go. Right here, there it is. Sixty-five point four. Sixty-five point four. So zinc is sixty-five point four grams per mole. Now we're in moles. So now we go moles of zinc to moles of hydrochloric acid. And we have one mole of zinc to two moles of hydrochloric acid. Okay, so moles of hydrochloric acid, we have, it's a two molar solution. So I got 2.00 moles per liter. And I wanna know how many milliliters that is. So milliliters is 10 to the minus three liters. Okay, set up. Grams cancel, moles, moles, liters. So we just do the math. So we've got 5.5 5 point, 5 point, ah, 5.95 divided by 65.4 times 2 divided by 2 equals that. And we bring this 10 to the 3 up. We change the signs because 10 to the 3rd. So 1, 2, 3, 90 point, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 90 point, 9, 90, no, 90, where am I at? 90 point, 9, 91 point 0, 91.0, so it rounds up, milliliters. Enough for one night. Doctor, can you answer one question for me? I'm trying, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm trying to, uh, on chapter 11, okay. I've tried 19 times. I, I emailed it. You emailed it to me? Um, yeah, it's uh, enter the balanced net ionic equation for my top reaction, which I already have, is uh, copper. Well, uh, copper uh, phosphate is a solid, right? And I keep trying to put it in and balance it, and it keeps telling me no. I don't know if you got it in the email. Yeah, I just got it right here. Okay. So it says complete and balance of electric equation for the reaction of aqueous copper two chloride. So it's Cu. CuCl2, right? Copper 2 chloride. Okay. And aqueous potassium phosphate. Potassium phosphate is K3PO4. Okay. And those are both aqueous, right? So I have the top part right, but not the bottom. I just can't get it. Okay. Oh, okay. I see what you did. You got the, the top part, you've got. Three, two, three. Sorry about my dog. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I got, I got dog here too, so no problem. So copper two phosphate, PO4 twice, right? Plus six KCl. All right, let's see if he balances right so we can do this. So this is a three. This is a two. This is a one and that's a six. So we should have three coppers, three coppers. We should have six chlorines, we have six chlorines. We should have six potassium, six potassiums, and two phosphates, two phosphates. So that's balanced. And that one's done right, right? So now we break it apart. We have three Cu2 plus plus six Cl minus, okay? Plus six K3 
plus plus 2 PO4 3 minus. That's the left side, right? Is that what you got breaking it up? Um, I, isn't that the molecular? The, the top one you're doing? And then we're going to do the toland and the net ionic. Okay. And then this is the solid. Cu3. All right. So let's get rid of the spectator ions. And the net result should be three Cu2 plus plus two PO4 three minus goes to Cu3 PO4 twice. And this should be solid and these should be aqueous. Oh, I see what you did. Where? Why did you put a three in front of the Cu2PO4? I was just trying to figure it out in every single way possible. Okay, because so it kept it kept kicking me back for everything I put on there. Yeah. So go from the go from the balanced molecular to the the total to the net. Let me try this. Oh, I forgot a two here too. Hold on. You gotta make sure. V says PO4 twice. Yeah, so that's what I have to do there. Yeah, on, on the, the incorrect one, it's, it shows you a three for the, on the right side of the equation. Yes. This shouldn't be. It should just be, this space right here should just have be blank. You, you have a three there. That's, okay. that's what's making it wrong. The rest of it's right. Okay, I got it. Thank you. So you, yeah, you had a three there and you had a two here too. Okay, so you, you fixed both those spots? 